2014 was a breakthrough year for us here on MedTalk. Not only did we chalk up 50 episodes on our way to our second anniversary, we were graced by some of the country's most distinguished medical experts as we sought solutions to common health problems plaguing the Filipino. Tonight, let's look back at the year that was with some of our most memorable episodes, tackling both the most fatal and the most common medical concerns in the country today. Have a happy and healthy Christmas, everyone. I'm Angel Jacob, and this is MedTalk, your weekly on-air health consultation here on 9TV. A stroke may come unexpected, and when it strikes, the result can be fatal. Usually referred to as a brain attack, one in every six people across the globe will experience a stroke in their lifetime. A stroke is usually sudden. Attacks from out of the blue can often be fatal. Ang ibig sabihin ng stroke ay may bigla ang pagkasira ng mga sel sa utak, no? So maaaring nabara yung daanan ng dugo, eh yung daanan ng dugo nagsusupply ng oxygen. Pag nabara yung daanan ng dugo, mamamatay yung cells. Experts usually refer to it as a brain attack and is often blamed to the narrowing of arteries from an accumulation of cholesterol. Biglang nabulol or kaya biglang namanhid or nanghina isang parte ng katawan or bigla na lang nahimatay, no? nawala ng malay or kaya severe headache or biglang pasuray-suray na yung lakad. Based on Philippine health statistics, diseases of the heart have been identified as the number one cause of deaths in the country since 1990. In fact, 167,000 Filipinos die from a heart attack and stroke each year. So it can happen to anyone, even to you and me, no? So now, younger na yung mga na-stroke, maari sinabi mo nga yung lifestyle, madaming bisyo ngayon, no? Sigarilyo, alak, even drugs, no? And also the stressful condition in our workplace, kailangan healthy lifestyle, tamang diet, exercise, kung may mga sakit kayo, halimbawa high blood, diabetic kayo, may mga ibang sakit pa, no? So i-maintain yung medicine, magkonsulta parati sa doctor, and then uh, iwasan ang bisyo. What exactly is the nature of a stroke? Uh, ano bang nangyayari sa isang tao pag siya ay nagsasuffer ng stroke? Dr. Yeah. June? Yeah. Uh, stroke is a brain attack. This is due to a disturbance in blood flow to the brain resulting in different neurological def deficit depending upon the parts of the brain that is affected. Now, stroke can be due to a blockage in the blood vessel, yung baradong ugat, or this could be due to a ruptured blood vessel and depending again on the site then patient can be disabled because of this illness so this is an emergency that requires immediate treatment and immediate uh, uh, going into the hospital for proper care mm -hmm. um, yes, yes, I add yes please um, this is uh, an example this is like a model of the brain mm -hmm. and what we want to emphasize is the brain does not store anything no, so, wala siyang pagkukunan. So, when a stroke happens, when the blood vessel gets blocked or pumutok, then there's no blood supply. So, walang oxygen, walang glucose, and the brain cells die. Mm -hmm. You mean that it doesn't store anything unlike other parts of the body that store our fat? Yes. And that store liquids? Yes. This one does not store, does not anything. store anything. That's why the brain demands constant blood flow. Mm -hmm. And when a stroke occurs, doon nababara o natitigil yung pagdaloy ng dugo. Mm -hmm. At pag nabara or natigil yung daloy ng dugo, this is, uh, uh, it can be, uh, it can cause paralysis, it yes. can cause different uh, manifestations of uh, yung pagbabara dun sa so, particular part of the parang brain. Parang yung nasabi nga ni Tina, itong harap na to is for movement. So yes. in a patient who develops a stroke on this right side of the brain, they develop a left-sided weakness. On this side, numbness. This will be for vision. This will be for balance. Dito, yung paggalaw ng mata, 
Dito yung giwi na mukha, dito yung paglunok at pagkahilo. So each part of the brain has special function. So depending on the blood vessel that was affected, yun yung manifestation ng stroke sa pasyente. Mm -hmm. There are certain uh, manifestations na na-mention yun na parang heart attack din. Uh, what, what is the difference or the similarity of a stroke and a heart attack? Una-una uh, yung heart attack, uh, it means ang naapektuhan is yung puso. Uh, sa, sa stroke, no, ang sinasabi natin is ang utak. It's atake rin, no, biglaan yung presentation, pero hindi ang puso, mm -hmm. ang utak. Now, ang most common presentation ng pasyenteng may heart attack is pain. No? Pwedeng sumakit yung dibdib, biglang sakit na matindi, and yun nagpapadala sa kanila sa ospital. Mm -hmm. Sa stroke, pwedeng hindi pain. No? E, pwedeng manhead ang isang parte ng katawan, pwedeng mahina, pwedeng bulol, mm -hmm. pwedeng pagkabulag ng isang mata, o matinding sakit ng ulo. So, pwede rin may pain, pero depende nga no, kung anong part of the brain ang tatamaan. Mm -hmm. So, pwede silang magsabay, no, pero kung titingnan mo, iba yung atake. Yung isa atake sa puso, isa atake sa brain. Uh, you mean sabay pwede mangyari yes. at the same time sa isang individual? Merong mga pasyente kami nakikita oh. na sabay. No, Nagka-atake sa puso, at the same time, nagka-atake rin sa brain. Mm -hmm. Doon sa heart attack, karaniwan baradong ugat. Compared to that, Yes. Sa brain natin, it could be barado, but it can also be a rupture of a blood vessel. Mm -hmm. So, hindi kasing madaling i-diagnose. Kaya dapat humarurut sa hospital. Yun ang okay. sinasabi. So, immediately hospital. talaga. Immediately. No? Which brings us time. to uh, uh, understanding the different types of strokes. I, I understand there are three types. Let's yes. start with the ischemic. Um, actually, dalawa yung major. Mm, no? okay. Pero yung pangalawa, pwede pang hatiin. So, yung una yung tinatawag ng ischemic. Ischemia mm -hmm. means kulang sa daloy ng dugo dahil sa bara. Okay. okay. Yung isa, yung tinatawag natin hemorrhagic. Hemorrhage means blood. So, yung ugat pumutok. No? At yung blood na dapat nasa loob ng vessel, kumakalat sa utak. Mm -hmm. At dalawa pa yung subtype nun. Kaya nagiging tatlo. Okay. So, yung isa, yung blood, pwedeng kumalat mismo dito sa brain. Okay. Ang tawag namin intracerebral sa loob. Meron naman na um, pag pumutok, yung blood ay eh, kumakalat dito sa bases, so sa baba, dito sa covering ng brain. Ang tinatawag namin doon, subarachnoid hemorrhage. Mm -hmm. Medyo magkaiba yung dahilan ng dalawang klaseng stroke na to. Again, depending on kung saan pumutok Again, yung blood yun vessel yun. na yun. And then the... Uh, At iba-iba rin nga pala ang ating treatment depende sa type, type of stroke. stroke. Okay. Kaya maselan talaga eh. Oh, it's, it's the most complex uh, organ of the body, no? I guess, ang um, mahirap intindihin ng brain, yeah. pero um, unique din siya because you know that each part of the brain has a particular function. Mm -hmm. So, alam mo na merong isa na bahala na kumontrol sa isang part ng body. And as na masabi natin sa brain, yung capacity niya to learn and recover is... Talaga misan magugulat ka na lang, no? Even mm -hmm. for stroke patients na may have deficits, pag uwi, after some time, they recover. Mm -hmm. Because that's the capacity of the brain to recover and repair itself. Mm -hmm. With immediate uh, yes. um, uh, medical attention, ang, no? Ang outcome is also dependent on how fast patients are brought in the hospital. Mm -hmm. So how fast patients are brought in the hospital, before bringing a, a patient to the hospital, we have to know the signs and the symptoms. So yes. let's, uh, mm -hmm. let's understand the signs and symptoms of ischemic, uh, one who has had a stroke. Siguro para sa stroke, for the lay people, we use yung acronym na FAST. F-A-S-T. Mm -hmm. F stands for face. Tumingin sa salamin. If you see any facial asymmetry, mm -hmm. baka may mm -hmm. Arm, you raise the arm. You see if one arm is going down or you may do an arm roll. If one is not moving, mm -hmm. then arm, there might be weakness of one side. And then speech. Subukan mo bang salita Tingnan mo, pakinggan ng iba. Kung hindi ka maintindihan, utal ka. Then, yung T, time. You have to rush to the hospital. May I add, rush to a hospital, dapat sana yung merong makaprovide ng proper stroke service. Mm -hmm. uh, these um, signs or these symptoms of one who's suffering a stroke can mimic other uh, medical conditions such as Bell's palsy, yung uh, paralysis yes. in a certain area of the face and not able to to speak, no? Or nagsaslur na. There are conditions that affect the brain also. So the manifestations may look like a stroke. No? Ang common dyan, yung minention mo nga, na 
uh, Bell's palsy, but that's a nerve problem, not a brain problem. Now, ang pwedeng magmukhang stroke would be tumors, no? may mga bukol sa brain, mm -hmm. or minsan pwede rin mga uh, meningitis or infection sa brain. Mm -hmm. Pero ang something that unique sa stroke is yung biglaan. Okay. Yung suddenness ng presentation ng pasyente. Mm -hmm. Kasi yun yung dahil sa biglang pagbara or biglang pagputok ng ugat. Okay. And um, yung biglaang pagbara o pagputok ng ugat, is it brought about by... Um, a medical condition that has been lingering in the patient? Well, pag ganyan, dapat we have to understand the risk factors for stroke. Mm -hmm. Well, there are two major types. Yung iba, modifiable. Yung isa, non-modifiable. Yung mga modifiable, yung age, oh. sex, minsan. Yung pag-race uh, natin. Mm -hmm. A history of previous stroke. Then, wala tayong magagawa. These patients are really prone to another stroke or to a stroke. Mm -hmm. Now, ang mas importante siguro, each of us should know Ano yung mga modifiable risk factors? Alam natin lahat yan, parang similar to heart disease kasi blood vessel yan. So mm -hmm. we talk about hypertension, diabetes, heart diseases, previous heart attack, o yung irregular heartbeat, mga lifestyle changes, di ba? Yan yung mga smoking, excessive alcohol, of course, yung cholesterol, pag tumataas ang ating cholesterol. Now, there are newer other risk factors like, of course, yung obesity, physical inactivity, and lately, even yung mga snoring. Yeah. These are known risk factors that are associated with stroke. Mm -hmm. And if a patient or a subject knows that he has these risk factors, he has to cut down on this risk factor if he wants to avoid to have a stroke mm -hmm. or do the proper management. Mm -hmm. So lifestyle changes and then management medicines. Mm -hmm. So, who should one see, before we cut to a break, who should one see um, for, uh, to monitor all these uh, conditions so it doesn't lead to a stroke? Dr. Tina. Um, if you look at the risk factors like hypertension, diabetes, uh, mataas na cholesterol, this can be managed by general physicians. So, kaya yon. Uh, important really is not just detecting na may problema, but making sure that this uh, medical conditions are adequately controlled. Mm -hmm. Yun yung problema minsan, nagagamot, pero hindi naman kontrolado talaga. So, mataas pa rin yung blood pressure, mataas pa rin yung cholesterol. Mm -hmm. So, we need adequate control of risk factors. Okay, so general physician, but... Uh, uh, but siguro, I mean, depende, you know, if you have cardiac conditions, then there may be some, ano, siguro kung you want to go to a cardiologist, kung irregular yung heartbeat mo, or meron kang congenital heart problems, but in general, you know, there is factors like hypertension, cholesterol can be managed by um, physicians. After the break, we'll look back and discuss heart ailments anew. So stick around. We'll be back for more here on the Best of MedTalk 2014. Welcome back to the Best of Med Talk 2014. A look back on some of the most memorable moments in the show. This time we'll revisit our episode on heart ailments to discuss the many ways on how we can make better food choices and other lifestyle decisions in an effort to keep our hearts healthy and running smoothly. It's toted as one of the deadliest killer diseases in the country today. Based on the recent data collected from the World Health Organization, roughly 17 million people succumb to cardiovascular diseases every year, making it one of the leading causes of death in the Philippines. The most common heart ailment is coronary artery disease, which is basically an obstruction of the artery of the heart. We call it coronary arteries, and this is secondary to uh, smoking, unhealthy diet, and lack of exercise. In fact, according to the National Statistics Office, 5 out of 10 deaths in the country can be traced to cardiovascular causes. So it's an, a silent epidemic right now. It is lumped under the category of the non-communicable diseases. The good news, however, 
is that you have the ability to take charge of your life. For instance, good eating habits and lifestyle changes can add more years to your life. Kung pattern kasi sa foreign, like sa US, di ba ang, ang uh, usually vegetables nila, broccoli, cauliflower, uh, lettuce, cucumber. Sa atin, for Filipino, pang masa, pwede yun yung mga, kunyari, sinigang, maraming kangkong, eggplant. In general, ganito yung plate niya, uh, half nung plate, almost vegetable, and then one-fourth yung uh, fruit. And then yung protein niya, and then supposedly nandito yung kanin. Ito yun, carbs. Tapos yung beverage. It is very important. Ang lifestyle kasi yung pang-araw-araw mong ginagawa. Eh. Ngayon, doon sa pang-araw-araw mong ginagawa, medyo nabibilibid ka doon eh, ng konti. Why? Because because of your duties, let's say, as a physician or even physician, estudyante, uh, in the workplace or community, hindi mo alam yung ginagawa mo, nakakasama na pala sa health mo. And since heart disease is a well-documented ailment, there are numerous support groups, research and information out there on why it happens and on how you can help yourself to prevent it. Good evening. It's Heart Health Month. It's yes. Heart Month. It's a Heart Month. So it's time to get our hearts healthy. By getting our hearts healthy, let's first talk about what is the feeling of someone who has a healthy heart. What is it like to have a healthy heart? I'll, for, I'll go first, Janos. <laughs> Ladies first. Ladies first. <laughs> Normally, we don't feel our heart. I would dread if anyone say, I can feel my heart pumping. Normally, we don't. So the moment we become conscious of our heart speaking to us through symptoms, that usually is a first sign that probably something is wrong. There are some symptoms that you actually have to be worried about. We were talking a while ago, like, if, for example, on my daily activities, I walk from my house to my office, and I don't feel anything. Then suddenly, for a past couple of days, I find that it's getting to be a little bit harder. I'm getting short of breath when I reach the office. Think, why is that so? Number two, as I mentioned, the heart doesn't talk to us. Mm -hmm. It pumps now as I'm talking. But if I can feel it pumping while I'm talking, maybe that's what we call palpitation. And that could be a sign that your heart has something going on. Mm -hmm. And of course, the most common but dreaded and most renowned symptom is paninikip, chest pain. Mm -mm. So when you have chest pains, when you used not to have it, maybe you would wonder why. And that could, those are some of the symptoms that you could have a heart. So a healthy heart is a heart that doesn't speak nor make itself felt. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah. it's a silent heart, so to speak. Yes. Right. Yeah, it, yes, allow, it, allows you to, it allows you to do a lot of things you wanted to do. Primarily exercise, no? because exercise intolerance is one of the main reasons why people will worry, oh, why am I short of breath? Why am I not being able to do this when I was much younger? So, and even uh, in younger kids, uh, parents bring patients to me, their children complaining of, uh, they complain of shortness of breath, uh, chest heaviness, you know, pounding chest, so all of those things. So usually if your heart is really healthy, you can really uh, push yourself. In, in, in pushing ourselves, how do we maintain the health and um, how do we maintain a strong heart? How do we do that? Well, the primary, a while ago, Dr. Yachon mentioned it. There's nothing wrong with the formula of a healthy lifestyle. In order to maintain a healthy body, proper nutrition, proper exercise, maintaining your weight, avoid the vices. But of course, those are the most difficult things to do. Right, John? Yeah, yeah. Now, the heart is a muscle. You know? Just like anything, uh, if you're, it's a muscle, it's something that you also can train. So, someone who is, um, let's say, eating right, but probably does not exercise, in a way, will not be the same as someone who is eating right and also try to push that heart to, to, uh, to work a little bit. So, it's a muscle. And so, we have people who are, if you compare someone who is probably a triathlete, mm -hmm. He definitely is more, I mean, he can really last running for kilometers or miles because his heart over time has really gotten bigger and more, you know, really uh, ready for, for that kind of stress. So there's also an element of trying to uh, push your, this muscle to, 
to be able to withstand the stress. Mm -hmm. So we've uh, talked about uh, pushing your heart, which is a muscle to withstand the stress. We've talked about a healthy heart, which is silent, doesn't really speak to us. But when we are not able to take care of our heart, it speaks to us already. Is that right, Dr. Garcia? And how does it speak to us? What are the signs and symptoms of the most common heart diseases? Um, as an adult cardiologist, probably, I've already mentioned sign of the, uh, some of the signs and symptoms. One, chest pain. Chest discomfort is a proper word than pain. Sometimes there's a chest tightness that you feel, and it's unusual. More, most of the patients I've asked will say it's really an unusual feeling, mm -hmm. like air is caught in, inside your chest, and it just persists, and it waxes and wanes. And then later on, you will find that it becomes more prominent every day. Initially, it's once a week, then becomes twice a week, then later it's daily. And it is also affected by activity. The more activity you do, the more it comes out. And it's not alone. Sad to say, misery loves company. Mm -hmm. In this case, chest pain is also accompanied by that shortness of breath. And sometimes this is also accompanied by palpitation. And as mentioned by Jonas, exercise intolerance. Now, I cannot do the things I used to do. So the normal tendency of some people is that denial is very strong. I tend to cut down on the activities I do. If I feel chest pain when I walk, let's say, a kilometer, I'll start stopping before that kilometer comes. Take my breath, then walk. Not knowing that is already a sign that something is going on. So that's maybe the reason why, more often than not for adults, they go to the doctor when it's a little bit into the moderate intensity of pain already, mm -hmm. rather than the early phase. Mm -hmm. Rather than go as soon as they feel that there's something wrong. Mm -hmm. Is it the same case for children? Like their parents <laughs> bring them? Yeah, well, the children, they usually sometimes will also complain of chest pain. But uh, luckily, mostly the chest pain in, in kids, it's not really due to heart disease. It's usually musculoskeletal pain. But we, of course, we also pay attention to this. Okay? Uh, in children, it's more of... Um, feeding difficulties, fast breathing. Parents will bring their kids, they're worried because the, their kids are not growing well or their weights are really kind of like at a standstill. Mm -hmm. um, when you are uh, the more complex heart diseases in children, and I think we're going to discuss it later, the ones with congenital heart defects totally have different signs and symptoms. But in terms of what they usually will volunteer, I mean, chest pain is still there, shortness of breath, especially the older ones, those who are in the adolescents who are almost adults. So they will be complaining pretty much the same way as the, uh, the adults. We're also concerned about uh, kids who pass out, mm -hmm. especially when they are in, uh, in the field, in the playing fields. Mm -hmm. Athletes who will suddenly collapse in the playing field. That's something that's a red flag that we actually have to investigate if they have a heart problem. Mm -hmm. uh, having a heart problem when they pass out on the field, um, due to other factors, the heat, too yes, much <clears throat> that's right. So there are environmental or you know, stress factors outside of what you have. But you, you take that into consideration. But at the same time, you also have to make sure this athlete is actually this, is, is, uh, safe, has a heart, normal heart to be able to, to play. Mm -hmm. And we speak of a normal heart. We speak of paninikip ng dibdib earlier. Uh, how do we distinguish a paninikip ng dibdib chest pain from heartburn? Uh, that's pretty difficult, honestly, because uh, the esophagus is right behind the heart. So the description I just gave a while ago, there's a reason it's called heartburn, mm -hmm. because it simulates paninikip. It simulates a, like a heart attack symptom. Mm. So it's very difficult to differentiate. We would probably advise the moment you do feel that, don't test yourself. Go to a doctor, go to an expert ask which one you're actually having, and they could run tests to make sure that you are not actually suffering from a heart attack. Stay with us because after the break, we'll continue to revisit your favorite episodes for 2014, here on The Best of MedTalk. Welcome back to the Best of Med Talk 2014. The liver is the largest gland of the human body and does so much to ensure our well-being. Yet most people take it for granted with poor everyday decisions such as smoking, heavy alcohol intake, and a fatty diet. 
This time, let's talk about liver cancer anew, the third leading cause of death in the Philippines, with 20 deaths recorded daily according to the International Agency for Research on Cancer. It is one of the deadliest cancers in the world today. For every 100 people to be diagnosed with liver cancer, 95 of them will likely die due to the disease. It has an incidence of something like 6,000 6, to 8,000 uh, cases per year. And it is very fatal in the sense that almost all of them die within 6 to 8 months. According to the International Agency for Research on Cancer, liver cancer is now the third leading cause of cancer deaths in the Philippines, with 20 deaths recorded daily. Liver cancer is a type of malignancy in the liver. It has two kinds. One, the primary liver cancer. And then the other kind of liver cancer is called metastatic liver cancer. This is the cancer that spreads to the liver from other organs. Most liver cancer cases are fatal since it is often diagnosed at an advanced stage. It can usually be traced to infection from the hepatitis B virus with symptoms such as fatigue, loss of weight and appetite, discoloration of the eyes, vomiting and many others. If ever they will develop symptoms, the most common is weight loss, followed by right upper abdominal discomfort, and then a palpable mass in the right upper abdomen or in the epigastric area, which is the middle portion of the upper abdomen. So those are the manifestations. Other known risk factors include cirrhosis, or the formation of scar tissue in the liver, diabetes, obesity, and non-alcoholic liver disease. Patient will develop a chronic liver disease, whatever the cause, and in the Philippines, the most common is chronic hep B. The other chronic liver diseases that can lead ultimately to liver cancer are hepatitis C, fatty liver, alcoholic liver disease, and those metabolic liver disease that are not treated and subsequently develop liver cancer. But liver cancer is highly preventable. You should know the limits when it comes to alcohol drinking. Number two, as I mentioned, you have to avoid too much of oily and fatty foods. Develop the habit of exercising even just three times a week, especially if you're gaining weight, to prevent fatty liver. And then number three, if you are exposed to patients or individuals who are at risk of hepatitis B, you have to be vaccinated. And number four, of course, you have to check even just one every year or every three years, your liver function test and ultrasound. September is Liver Cancer Awareness Month. And um, before we get into um, understanding and um, learning more about liver cancer, let's first uh, educate us first on the function of our liver. Dr. De Villa, let's start with you. Okay, uh, the liver is the largest solid organ of the body. It's about 2% of one's body weight. So if you're a 60 kilogrammer, it will weigh about 1.2 kilograms, roughly. Mm -hmm. So the liver has many functions. It's a gland, it's a very big gland. Uh, number one, it's, it's a factory. It produces substances, you know, proteins that the body needs for, for metabolism, like albumin, clotting factors, help in clotting blood. It detoxifies, it helps detoxify blood from harmful substances like alcohol, drugs. Um, it produces bile as well, and bile is important in digestion of food, especially fat, mm -hmm. uh, breaking it down to substances that can, that can be easily absorbed by the body. It's also a storage organ, you know, for simple sugars, vitamins, and iron uh, that can be used you know, when the body needs them. Mm -hmm. And uh, it also is important in the breakdown of ammonia into urea, which is important, again, in, in the metabolism of the body. Mm -hmm. So many different functions of our liver. Yes. I, I didn't yeah, realize yeah. that <laughs> it had all these functions. And um, maybe because we don't see it. You don't notice not, it. You don't yeah. notice it. But it does so many wonderful things to our body to keep us healthy. Yes. And when we neglect 
uh, our liver, it, it causes so many different types of illnesses. And um, one of the biggest um, uh, illness or disease that the liver uh, can have is uh, liver cancer. That's, That's correct. Yes. So um, what, what causes liver cancer? Now we know the function of our liver. How, uh, what causes liver cancer? Dr. There Fernando? are a lot of causes, but most common is um, if you have chronic hepatitis B or chronic hepatitis C, chronic alcohol ingestion or heavy alcohol intake, um, if you have um, fatty liver, and um, other causes would be aflatoxins um, that you, you found in um, those that are uh, in peanuts, in corns, that were not properly stored. Um, okay. caused by a fungal aspergillus flavus, mm -hmm. something like that. And mm -hmm. these, uh, these that you've mentioned are not genetic in any form? They are uh, acquired? It can be passed from a mother to a child if the mother has hepatitis B. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, uh -huh. and uh, briefly, how does one uh, contact hepatitis B again and see? So, uh, hepatitis B, you can get it from blood transfusions, primarily hepatitis C from infected needles. Mm -hmm. And um, the alcohol, uh, you yeah. mentioned alcohol abuse as well. Yes. A heavy alcohol drinker is uh, defined as an intake of alcohol of, uh, of about 40 to 60 grams a day and one uh, simple drink is about 14 grams so for females they said um about three drinks two to three and for males about more three to four something this like that this is daily yes your daily alcohol mm -hmm. intake will indeed take a toll on your liver uh, what what happens to the liver uh, let's let's take for example a heavy drinker what happens to the liver does the liver have to work double time to be able to absorb the alcohol or excrete or, or eliminate the alcohol dr devilia yes alcohol is toxic to the liver so if you drink too much it can destroy the liver so the liver is destroyed when uh, there's an insult of whatever form no uh, maybe viral hepatitis, which is the most common here in the Philippines, mm -hmm. hepatitis B especially, and then um, alcohol, as we mentioned, fatty liver can also eventually lead to cirrhosis. Mm -hmm. So when the liver gets damaged, it's usually a slow kind of damage, you know, hindi biglaan, although you can also have acute uh, liver failure. But this, this type of damage we're talking about that predisposes to cancer, is a slow damage that leads to fibrosis or scarring of the liver and eventually becomes cirrhosis. No? Mm -hmm. So a cirrhotic liver is a, you know, one big scarred liver. So it becomes uh, fibrotic, hard, and in that environment of abnormal cells and abnormal growth, uh, that environment favors the growth of cancer. Mm -hmm. So that's what happens. Okay, so you mentioned, you've mentioned uh, cirrhosis is one form of um, the cancer. No, it can uh, cause. It can cause the liver cirrhosis. cancer. It yeah. can cause liver cancer. There are other um, factors that can cause liver cancer aside from cirrhosis. Uh, would you like? To yes, mention we've mentioned that? it already. No, mm -hmm. um, too much fat can cause um, liver cancer. Mm -hmm. um, uh, your hepatitis, but primarily it's caused by the chronic hepatitis B or C hepatitis B or C because uh, they can lead to cirrhosis of the liver and that cirrhosis can damage your liver and eventually make you at risk for uh, developing lung cancer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, once one has been uh, diagnosed or with um, liver cancer, how, how does the body function uh, after being di with lo diagnosed with um, liver cancer? Dr. Devine. Oh, normally, um, unless you have a screening program where you detect them early, the most usual thing is that you detect them late, you know. Why is when, that? Why is it always uh, uh, detected at a later stage? Yes, because the liver is big. It's a huge solid organ. So if the cancer is in the middle, you, you don't really feel it. Mm -hmm. But if it's, if it's like at the edge or it protrudes already, it's growing so big that it protrudes, then that's the time you begin to feel something. Mm -hmm. So it's very common here, especially in our country or maybe even in Asia, that when, when the symptoms start to appear, the cancer is usually at a rather advanced stage. Mm -hmm. Now, when people screen, when there are people who know their risk factors and they screen, or the doctors uh, um, suggest or recommend screening or screen their patients, then the cancer is detected at an early age stage when they are still small. Mm -hmm. And this is uh, preferable because this is when we can still do something, when we can still treat the, the cancer. Mm -hmm. So when you know that you're predisposed to uh, liver cancer, 
then uh, all the more you should be more vigilant and you yes, should go correct. for screening. Yes, how, correct. how often should the uh, individual do screening once they know that they're predisposed to liver cancer? It depends. If you're cirrhotic, you can do liver ultrasound combined with a blood test like an alpha fetoprotein every six months. Mm -hmm. So cirrhotic meaning, cirrhotic meaning you're, you're prone? You're scarred. You yeah. have cirrhosis. You have cirrhosis. Yes. cirrhosis. Okay. Scarred and fibrosis of the liver with nodules. Mm -hmm. Depends on like the Like the, what we saw on the, yeah. uh, the video, no? Yeah. So there are people who are more prone to cirrhosis and there are others who uh, have a different um, cause for, for liver cancer. Isn't that correct? Yes. yes. Okay. It has been found now that well, patients with chronic hepatitis B Sometimes even if they do not have cirrhosis yet, but they have a long-standing infection already, they may develop this. And diabetes is now associated with development of liver cancer as well. Mm -hmm. We may see them even when they are not yet really, uh, they do not have full-blown cirrhosis yet, but they may already have some fibrosis or scarring, parang may tama na yung liver. Mm -mm. And then it's also associated with metabolic uh, syndrome. Mm -hmm. uh, these are the things that we see now associated with liver cancer. Mm -hmm. You mentioned may tama na yung liver. So, on the outside, hindi naman mapapansin kung may tama na yung liver. It's upon uh, consultation with a doctor, you know. Um, briefly, the signs or the symptoms that uh, will manifest once your liver uh, is already um, scarred damaged. or damaged? It depends actually. Initially, you don't have any symptoms, but later you can have abdominal pain, you can have weight loss, you, have, uh, you don't feel like eating. Uh, at later stages, you can have ascites, meaning you have fluid in the abdomen, or you can be jaundiced, uh, naninilaw, at mm -hmm. the later stage. Okay. Just normally complain of bloatedness, bloating, that they could not really explain, and then easy fatigue, they get tired easily, loss of appetite, as you said, and then their skin color changes, eventually they also develop yellowing of the eyes, Mm -hmm. And then non-specific abdominal pain, especially in the upper abdomen. Mm -hmm. They also somehow uh, present with the symptoms of cirrhosis because many times they also don't know they have cirrhosis. And mm -hmm. on top of that cirrhosis, they have cancer. Mm -hmm. When they have abdominal enlargement already due to fluid or edema, uh, worse symptoms, then it's usually already advanced stage. Mm -hmm. How long should these symptoms uh, last? How, how long should you feel them before you uh, consult your doctor? Actually, it depends on the person. Some will be, with con even without symptoms, they, they, they really go to a doctor. Sometimes in the late stages, that it has spread already to the other organs or to the bones or to the lungs. That's late stage already. Mm -hmm. So for people, we recommend, especially those with cirrhosis, they should see consult for screening already like they can do a liver ultrasound or they can do blood exams to see if their liver is functioning like an SGPT like that or an alpha fetoprotein which are tumor markers mm -hmm. that are common for liver cancers. Those who are prone to liver cancer uh, aside from those uh, we've mentioned uh, earlier are, are, are there other types of individuals who are more prone than others? Dr. Tevilia. Well, as we said, you, we're talking about primary liver cancer here, right? That it originates from the liver. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, those who are prone are those who have chronic hepatitis B. And again, we go back to those who have cirrhosis. Mm -hmm. all, all people who have cirrhosis of any, any cause are those who are most uh, prone to liver cancer. Mm -hmm. And then the diabetics, but not all of them. And then pain, people who have uh, fatty liver and what we call the metabolic syndrome, mm -hmm. yung hypertensive, obese, um, it's, it's a conglomerate of symptoms that uh, usually also lead to some damage in the liver. Mm -hmm. We can't, um, uh, we have to keep reminding everyone of these symptoms, these, these factors, no? because we want them to remember all of these things and to be more mindful of how their body functions or if their body's not functioning well. Isn't that right, doctor? Um, right, so if they have you know, some risk factors, they can be more vigilant and have themselves tested the sooner. Mm -hmm. And during these tests, what, what, happen during, what happens during these tests, Dr. Um, to diagnose, you can do a CT scan or an MRI or just an ultrasound. Mm -hmm. And then um, you can do a biopsy of the liver. If, for example, the uh, scans are not definite, but you have a mass, we can do a liver biopsy. Mm -hmm. And um, 
by doing the liver biopsy, just in case it has um, a positive um, result that one has liver cancer, uh, so, how do we move on from there? So you have to know first if the mass is still resectable, meaning can they, can they remove it? Is it an early stage that you can have an operation or a liver transplant or a radiofrequency ablation? It depends. Mm -hmm. So after, if you have detected the mass, you also check other organs if it has metastasized already, na kung, kung kumalat na siya. Don't change channels because we have more in store for you here on the Best of Med Talk 2014. Welcome back to the best of MedTalk 2014. This time, let's talk about asthma, the third leading cause of hospitalization worldwide. In the Philippines, 10 million are currently suffering from asthma. Let's now identify the possible triggers again and see what we can do when asthma attacks. Asthma affects roughly 10.7 million Filipinos. Well, if you look at the, of the incidence of asthma, worldwide we have more than 230 million patients of asthma all over the world. And it's a common cause of hospitalizations, not only in children but also in adults. It's the third leading cause of hospitalizations worldwide, even here in the Philippines. Asthma is basically an hyper, um, it's an inflammation of the airways. It, uh, what happens is that there's bronchial reactivity, meaning yung daanan ng hangin, mabilis lumiit, malikot siya, and at the same time, it produces lots of, um, lots of phlegm. While it is not always apparent on what causes asthma to occur, the most common trigger usually comes from physical activities, or what is referred to as exercise-induced asthma. And also, it can be triggered by um, food. The most common are seafoods, so especially shrimp, crabs, eggs can trigger, especially the white of the egg, peanuts, and then um, the skin of the chicken can trigger asthma. Chocolates, cold temperatures, cold drinks can trigger processed foods, house dust mites. So these are the different triggers that can push a patient to into developing an asthmatic attack. If not treated, asthma can permanently narrow the airways and can easily translate to exposed nerve endings that will later on be even more susceptible to asthma triggers. So what is, what is asthma and what causes asthma? Well, ang, ang, ang asthma po is a napaka-interesting disease by itself. Katulad dun ng sabi sa primer, lumiliit po yung daanan ng hangin kaya nahihirapang pumasok at lumabas yung hangin. It is as simple as that. But ang, ang concern lang ho e, eh, minsan ho e, eh, nagkakaroon ng triggers na pagka sobra ang liit ng daanan ng hangin o nahihirapan tayong ipasok yung daanan ng hangin, e eh, talagang nahihirapang huminga ang isang tao, mm -hmm. bata o matanda. Mm -hmm. So pag nahihirapan huminga ang isang tao, um, it, it hampers their, their life, no? Siyempre their health, po. diba? Kasi yung oxygen, nahihirapan pumasok. Oxygen is quite vital. Day-to-day uh, -day life natin, siya ho eh, kailangan ng isang tao. So kung konti ang oxygen na pumapasok at meron hong byproduct ng metabolism na tinatawag natin carbon dioxide at kung hindi ho yun makalabas sa ating sistema, eh, malalason ho tayo. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That in itself, in, in a nutshell, is asthma. And how does one develop asthma? What are the signs of, um, of one who has asthma or has developed asthma? Ang, ang pananaw ngayon, ang asthma is basically a genetic disease. Mm. Ito ho ay namamana kung inyong tatay o nanay, higit na, eh, meron hong tinatawag na asthma. So meron na tayong predisposition sa ganong klaseng sakit. Mm -hmm. uh, meron hong mga pag-aaral na ginagawa na kung ang meron hong mga viral infection na nangyayari during nung tayo ay maliit o sanggol at maaring makapagbigay ng problema sa tinatawag nating pagpapaliit na daanan ng hangin. Mm -hmm. 
So, uh, yes, go ahead, Doctor. Yes, Th that itself is how we develop asthma. So, dapat na pakatandaan natin na ang asthma is a genetic disease. So, hindi po yun totally nawawala sa atin. Mm -hmm. It's a misconception among people that it can be outgrown, but it's yes. not correct. It's not correct. Minsan ho ay natutulog yan during at a certain age at only to come back at middle age. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, the signs and symptoms of, of asthma, Opo. doctor? So, katulad nung nasabi kanina sa primer, lumiliit po yung daanan ng hangin. Pagka lumiliit ang daanan ng hangin, tayo ay nahihirapan. So, makikita natin ng ating mga pasyente o yung ating mga mga yeah, mga patients who are afflicted with such a disease, mabilis ang paghinga. Mm -hmm. That's one. And then, mapapansin nyo kung sobrang liit, nangingitim ang labi at saka mga kuko. Okay. So, does one who have these symptoms uh, necessarily have asthma or pwedeng iba ang, ang uh, uh, sakit nila but the same symptoms? Well, you're quite correct. Quite correct. Mer meron kasi mga sakit na nakaka-simulate. It can simulate asthma. Mm -hmm. One of them, in fact, is pneumonia. It's a common disease. But yung manifestations na yun are not specific for asthma alone. Mm -hmm. So if the manifestations are not specific for asthma alone, how does the doctor diagnose? How do you, as a pediatric pulmonologist, diagnose someone who has these symptoms and who is uh, who has asthma? Ang ang pinaka ano niyan, pinaka clinical manifestation na dapat malaman nating lahat would be the presence of wheezing. Ito yung madalas na sinasabi ng mga tao na meron silang naririnig na parang kuting sa kanilang likod o pumipito. Mm -hmm. Yun by itself a ma manifestation ng asthma. Pero gusto ko lang huliwanagin sa ating mga manonood na hindi ho lahat ng pumipito o nagwi-wisel o nagwi-wis eh dahil sa asthma. Mm -hmm. But karamihan po noon eh dahil sa asthma. So, yun ang pinaka suguro, ang pinaka uh, sign na talagang ang isang pasyente ay eh, nagkakaroon ng acute attack of asthma from the layman's standpoint. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned acute attack of asthma. So what exactly is an acute attack? Aside from the, the wheezing, yung, <gasps> diba? Parang ganyan ba ang wheezing? Yung, well, yung, sound yung ginawa wheezing. mo would be, you're quite correct, yung, yung sound kasi yun naririnig natin, but yun e paloob. Mm. Ang asthma e palabas. So yung, yung palabas e, yun ang asthma, hindi po paloob oh, okay. ang tunog. Okay. Of course, mandatory rin na masabi ko na yung karamihan ng mga pasyente na inaatake ng asthma should have cough. So, dapat siya ay inuubo mm -hmm. mas lalo sa gabi o madaling araw. Mm -hmm. Or kung ma-identify mo yung triggers, yun ang nagiging dahilan kung bakit sila nauubo. Okay. And then, pagkapapakinggan nyo sa likod, meron siyang pumipito. Okay. So, uh, at night and in the morning, normally, um, allergies attack in the morning and at night. Minsan po, hindi ba doctor, like um, uh, pollen. Maybe you're allergic to pollen uh, and it happens in the morning or at night. So, uh, right. may, re may relation ba yan? Uh, well, in a sense, the answer is yes and no, actually. Ang dapat po nating tignan yung daanan ng hangin, eh hindi lang po yung isang tube na rigid. No, it's not. It's not correct. Natutulog din po yan, quote-unquote, mm -hmm. na pagdating sa gabi, lumiliit tila sila, sila talagang sadya. At pagdating ng araw, lumalaki din. So, it, siya ay flexible na lumiliit at lumalaki. Mm -hmm. Ngayon, kung isipin natin na pagka ang daanan ng hangin ay sadyang maliit sa gabi, at talagang lumiliit na sadya normally ang ating airways, then ang ibig sabihin nun, lalong nagmamanifest sila sa gabi o madaling araw it is not necessarily related sa pollen. Mm -hmm. But it may be associated with something inside the room. So, papaano po yan ang ibig sabihin? Kunyari, naka-carpet. Your room is fully carpeted. Ano po, yung, yung curtains, dahil merong dust, yes. then that's the time you have this kind of a problem. Mm -hmm. Sila ang nagtitrigger ng asthma. So, if you have asthma, at you're exposed to all these elements that you mentioned, lalo siyang... Uh, lalo siyang, uh, it will be on the rise, so to speak. Well, yes. In a way, yes. The answer is yes. But it, it triggers it. You know, kung, kung wala po itong triggers na yon, then naturally, yung asthma will not occur. The acute attack of asthma will not occur. Mm -hmm. There has to be a trigger for it to occur. Okay. So it may be external or internal 
stimulus. Ano ibig sabihin ng stimulus na internal? Pwede po kayong, kunyari, may mga asthmatics. And this is true among teenagers. Pagka, kunyari, kukuha ng exam, na, nadidepress sila, mm -hmm. sobrang galit. Yung, yung mga, may mga patients po tayo na tuwing magkakaroon po sila ng monthly period or pregnant sila, nakakapag-trigger ng acute attack of asthma. These are all internal stimuli or stimulus. Mm -hmm. This is in contrast to external stimulus. Meron kayong pollen, halimbawa, yes. or, or dust, or yung mga pets, mas lalo yung mga, yung mga sa aso o sa pusa, uh, mga balahibo o mga, mga feather, maari makapag-trigger ng acute attack of asthma. Mm -hmm. Meron din hong mga ibang uh, sakit na maari makapag-trigger ng asthma. Ang good example ho niyan pagka meron tayong what we call allergic rhinitis. Ang rhinitis is just a medical term. Ang ibig lang sabihin, may sipo na isang tao. Mm -hmm. But that's the one triggering it is an allergic uh, stimulus. Pagka meron tayong allergic rhinitis, may chance na magkaroon tayo ng acute attack of asthma. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the more commonly reported internal, this is, this is an internal stimulus that can trigger an acute attack of asthma is GERD or gastroesophageal reflux disease. Mm -hmm. So, ang ibig lang po sabihin nun, yung normally, pag kumakain tayo, yung ating pagkain from sa tiyan, dumediretso sa bituka. But ito ho, e, eh, umaakyat. So, instead na siya ay dumediretso sa bituka, yung ating kinakain, e, eh, umaakyat papunta, pabalik, pataas. Mm -hmm. yes. At pagka yun po, e, eh, napunta sa ating part, kung sa tayo humihinga, laryngeal area, papunta sa... Uh, sa trachea, yung ating daanan na hangin, it can trigger an acute attack of asthma. Mm -hmm. Th these triggers that you mentioned, external and, external and internal stimuli, yes. uh, stimuli are, are for those diagnosed with, with asthma already. Yes. But can you get asthma because of this external and internal stimuli mm -hmm. no. na hindi ka naman na-diagnosed before or hindi galing sa childhood? Hindi po. Th there has to be a genetically susceptible individual before you can develop it. Mm -hmm. Mayroon, meron hong always, that's the general rule, but meron hong mga exception certain to the rule. exception. Like, meron hong mga pag-aaral na ginawa na pagka nagkaroon ka ng viral infection ng ikaw e eh, maliit at mas mm -hmm. lalo't severe, it can lead to an asthma-like disease or condition. Mm -hmm. So if you're uh, a child and you had bronchitis, pwede bang mag-develop into asthma yun in adulthood? Right. You're quite correct. The, the bronchitis here is just inflammation of the bronchus or bronchi. And the inflammation can be attributed to a previous insult. And if you, if you say this is a previous insult secondary to a viral infection, then you may have these manifestations compatible with asthma. Ang tawag namin doon is asthma phenotype. Mm -hmm. Asthma what? phenotype, meaning to say, yung presentation niya is like asthma. Mm -hmm. Meron din nung kasi mga sakit na nangyari, kunyari, premature. Yung premature na baby, of course, na, na, na lumabas, nakakuha siya ng oxygen, na hindi naman dapat yung lung niya in a damage, mm -hmm. then it, it can lead to an asthma like phenotype or clinical presentation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the, the classifications uh, of, of asthma, mild, uh, understand, there's mild, there's severe? Uh, dalawa po yung uri ng pagkaklasify natin ng asthma. First is during an acute attack. Bakit kailangan po natin na maklasify ang asthma in the first place? We need to classify this primarily for treatment purposes. Hindi lang sa doktor, kung hindi pati na rin sa ating mga pasyente. So, ang una natin titignan kung ang isang pasyente ay merong acute attack of asthma. During an acute episode, nahirapan ho siyang huminga, ang titignan lang ho kung mild, moderate, or severe. Okay. Bakit ho kailangan na ganoon na i-classify? Dahil kung moderate to severe, higit na kung severe, kailangan na po natin siyang dalin sa ospital para makapagbigay ng appropriate treatment and oxygen. Mm -hmm. So, kailangan na ho niyang mag-oxygen para ma 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 ma, ma supplement na. yes mm -hmm. yung kanyang condition yung isang classification naman yung recurrences ng attack so ang ibig sabihin kung siya ay paulit-ulit ang magic number is 2 weeks kung siya ho ay paulit-ulit na nagkakaroon every 2 weeks nagkakaroon ng problema higit na kung nakaka-impair siya ng 1 pagtulog 
o pangalawa ng daytime activities, then meron ho tayong karampatang kaukulang gamot na maaring maibigay. Ang tawag ho doon is persistent type of asthma. Mm -hmm. Every two weeks yang nagkakaroon ng problema. So, in every two weeks, uh, kung nagkakaroon siya ng problema na ganyan, it, does he have to go or does she have to go to the the hospital? Kailangan ba siyang uh, bigyan ng oxygen also? Naman, like no. yung acute? No, you, you, hindi naman. But ang, ang essence lang doon is you try to give medicines that will prevent recurrences of the attack. Mm -hmm. So, that, that is basically the idea. Mm -hmm. And yun hong pagbigay ng medicine should come from a doctor because meron hong dalawang klase. Yung isa is inhaled steroids and the other one is uh, Montilucas or leukotriene antagonist. These are two classes of drugs. And ang, doc ang doktor ang siya magde-decide kung ano ang best for the individual. And this has been MedTalk for 2014. You're scheduled on-air consultation here on 9TV. I'm Angel Jacob. Happy holidays to you and your family. Good night.